What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Spot On Sports, where we're not just accurate, we spot on. And we got a special show for y'all today. We're talking about the 2021 MLB season, recapping the season, recapping the playoffs thus far, and talking about the World Series. We got a huge matchup between the Astros, who've been to the World Series now three times in the last five years, and the Atlanta Braves, who have not been to the World Series since 1999. And I couldn't be happier about the people I have with me talking today. I got to save one of my special guests for later. But right now, coming on with me, my line brother, just my brother, Jakari. He played baseball for TSU. Jakari, what's up, man? I'm so happy to be here talking with you, you know, talking about baseball, man, talking about the MLB season this year. Yeah, it was good, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a crazy year for uh, baseball, a uh, crazy year in general, especially for baseball and sports uh, overall. And it's like the greatest uh, part of the year right now, October, so much, you know, just sports going on. So happy to kind of recap MLB and get ready for uh, the World Series. So we're going to have a great series. So, yeah, real quick, you see we're repping. I'm, I'm kind of repping Jakari's Dodgers a little bit. Yeah, you know what I mean? we both repping the Sox. You know, so, so uh, Jakari, I, like I mentioned, you used to pitch at TSU, you know, so you're an expert. You want to tell them a little bit about what your ERA was at TSU? I, I would not like to mention my ERA. Um, it's high, very high. Um, but we, I do have a ring, though. I should have put it on. Yeah. I could have, you know, yeah. flexed on real quick. Flex. Um, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I pitched three years at TSU. Um, from Southern California, uh, so obviously big Dodger fan, and so yeah, just ready to talk everything baseball this year. So yeah, and when, a little bit later we'll be talking about the two teams that are going to be buying for a ring this year in the World Series. But Jakari, you know, last year because of COVID nineteen, we had the sixty game season, right? Things were really different, and especially for a sport like baseball that's so traditionalist, right? It's just such about tradition right. and just you know things always being the same. They don't really stray too far. Um, but we saw the 60 game season last year and things were weird. We saw players that, you know, we thought were great, have horrible seasons. We saw, you know, players that, you know, had bad seasons kind of come on last year um, and things were different. But ultimately, your Dodgers won the championship. We were able to get back to normal this year with the 162 game schedule. And because of that, we saw a lot of crazy things happen this year. So, Jakari, just kind of, you know, what's your biggest takeaways from from this first season being back 162 games? being back in front of the fans, being back in front of the, all the home stadiums, especially for the playoffs they were in the bubble last year. Just what were your biggest takeaways from this season, Jakar? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Biggest takeaway for me is uh, the impact of just the fans in that uh, kind of like home field advantage, right? Um, having the fans back in the crowd, you know, playing in front of thousands of people, that energy that you get from just hearing the crowd war, you know, double play turned or home runs late in games, all that just kind of atmosphere that we missed um, in, in 2020, bringing that back this year, I think was pivotal um, or crucial to having a really great season. Um, and we saw that come into play like so much, especially down the stretch here, which we'll probably get into later. Um, but just the fans and home field advantage going down the stretch in the playoffs had such a huge advantage. That's really my biggest takeaway. We take those things for granted sometimes, um, even just personally, like not being able to like really go to games like you want to or being at the game and not having that same like vibrant energy that you usually do um, with when the place is packed. So the fact that we were able to have fans back this year is great. Um, um, it's good for baseball. It's good for the you know viewers, et cetera. So happy that that's back. Yeah, definitely. That was a huge thing. And we saw that, you know, I think baseball probably out of the major sports has some of the best announcers. Right. And so just the calls, the fans, the electricity on we talked about on those uh, double plays, home runs, just game changing plays was, was great to see this year. I think for me, there was a couple big takeaways. Right. We had a huge um, thing happen in June. Right. Where the pitchers kind of started to get regulated. Right. We saw a lot of pitchers yeah. kind of in the past maybe with the sticky stuff. And, you know, we know it's hard to pitch. It's hard to hit baseballs. It's hard to pitch in baseball. Baseball is just a hard sport, period. And we, we've seen um, kind of, you know, teams and players will do little things to get advantages, right? But when baseball cracked down um, on the pitching, right, and the, the pitchers using the spider tack and different things like that, we saw an explosion of offense, right? We kind of saw yeah. at, and at the beginning of the, the, off, uh, the season, we saw a whole bunch of strikeouts. Pitchers were kind of dominating. We were on pace to have more no hitters than we ever had, right? in that first half of the season. So then baseball cracked down. Of course, you know, baseball wants to see the offense. They want to see the long ball. So they had to step Absolutely. in and say, hey, y'all are, are pitching too well. <laughs> y'all are pitching too well. <laughs> Not only are we going to play around with the baseballs, but we're going to check the yeah. pitchers in between innings. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to check the pitchers after every inning, right, and, and, and make sure. And then, of course, we saw um, less spin rate on the balls after that and more offense. So I think that was huge, right? I think that affected 
um, a lot of pitchers this year and just changed the game, right? That's something that pitchers have been using for decades, right? And that changed the game forever moving forward. Um, and a big thing for me, one of my biggest takeaways from the season is just the influx of young stars and the way that they played this year, right? When you talk about Tatis, you know what I'm saying, taking that next step, and he's only 22. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. almost winning the Triple Crown in the AL, like him being 22. Um, Ronald Acuna Jr., he was breaking out. You know yeah. what I mean? He already kind of broke out. But, I mean, he was having an MVP season. It was kind of him and Tatis uh, before he tore his ACL. Just a lot of young players um, across the league this year really broke out and took that next step. And it's always good to see. You know, baseball is that kind of sport where you have more longevity because it's just less taxing on the body kind of. So you see a lot of 40-year-old players in baseball, older players still dominating, like Max Scherzer, you know, him being 37 and things like that. But it's good right. to see the 22, 23, 24-year-olds, even Wander Franco coming on at 20 years old and looking dominant, right? Looking like, I mean, he's going to be a, a, a great shortstop for the next 15, 20 years. I mean, it, it just shows that the, the sport of baseball is in great hands, right? With the older players we have, the, you know, 30s, 25 to 30s, but even the younger players, right? We, we're Baseball is going to be in good hands for a long time. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention uh, my boy Juan Soto, even though he's been around, you know, for a couple of years now. He just keeps Absolutely. getting better. He's, I mean, he's insane. So he's one of my favorite players in the league. For sure. So that was kind of our biggest takeaways from the season, just being back to 162 games. But of course, takeaways come from moments, right? There were some huge moments this season, just some really fun, entertaining moments, a lot of milestones being passed and hit. Jakari, what were your favorite moments from this 2021 season being back to 162 games? Yeah, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a, a a defensive one, a pitching one, and an offensive one. I think I think mm -hmm. uh, let's start with offense. Uh, watching like the home run race across both leagues was great this year, right? We saw like you said the like resurgence of the long ball. Um, you know, after June, uh, it was great for baseball. Great, especially having fans back in 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 the play, and we saw stars like Shohei Otani come out and hit bombs in the American League at Angel Stadium. And we finally got a full 162 games from him. We saw the likes of Tatis, you know, really just crush the ball, leading the NL in home runs. I think my favorite the offensive moment was that ball he hit out of Dodger Stadium for sure. Um, you think about, like, the history of, like, the people who have done that um, and think how young that guy is, right? And think, like, he's, like, what, 22 years old, like you said? Yeah. Um, he doesn't even have, like, full, like, grown man weight. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and they short hit the ball out, <laughs> out of the short stadium. Side. Yeah, you know, to hit the crazy. ball at Dodger Stadium, like that's a John Carlos Stanton type type moment, a Mark McGuire mm -hmm. type moment, and for somebody like Tatis to do it is crazy. Um, so that would be my favorite, uh, I guess, moment for uh, offense and on the defense on the pitching side. I'm, I'm gonna have to go with Julio Urias winning 20 games this year. Um, I believe that hasn't been done the past five years in the National League, um, and and he's the number three guy on that Dodgers pitching staff. I think we can't like undermine the fact of like how hard winning 20 games is in baseball. When you know, like you talked about it, the checking of the sticky substances. Now they're always playing with the baseballs. They they want the long ball in play, and everything else like that. So to win 20 games to go out like he pitched this year, um, coming back after after the Dodgers won the 2020 World Series in the condensed season was great for him, and I think it really gave the Dodgers insight as to like what they have in their future going forward so yeah okay so that was the you gave us the pitching one and the offensive one did I miss one no that yeah that, that's both of them just those two okay cool 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 so my favorite moments of the season I kind of had some milestones some plays and some different things I think my favorite play of the season uh so Max Scherzer is my favorite player in the league and the Padres were playing the, the Nationals at the time he was still with the Nationals and I think the Nationals were up like eight two um, and the Padres were able to get the bases loaded. And that day they had called up a relief pitcher, not a position player, a relief pitcher, Daniel Camarena, uh, his first major league game. And he steps up to at bat with the bases loaded against a Hall of Fame pitcher in Max Scherzer, right? And you're thinking, like, why did the manager not pinch hit? Why is he letting this relief pitcher in his first MLB game hit with the bases loaded against Max Scherzer with a six-run deficit? And, of course, he hits a home run because of baseball. He hits a grand slam off of a Hall of Fame pitcher in his first MLB game. A pitcher hits a grand slam off of a Hall of Fame pitcher in his first MLB game. The crowd was crazy in Slam Diego. His family went crazy. Of course, they were there because it was his first major league game. Right. It was just one of the more beautiful moments um, in sports this year, really. Uh, I, I thought it was great. Uh, we talked about the Field of Dreams game yesterday, but the Field of Dreams game was great for baseball. I thought it uh, brought in a lot of interest. I think the, the, the viewership – for that game broke records. I think it was the most watched uh, MLB game this year before the playoffs and, and probably the most watched game in a while. Um, just the White Sox yeah. and the Yankees, they put on a complete show. 
um, in Iowa. And, and the, the, the scenery was crazy, right? I know a lot of people had nostalgia from watching the movie. I've never seen the movie, but just that game, I mean, it was just so special. And then, of course, the way it ended with Tim Anderson hitting that walk-off, one of the better moments in, in Major League Baseball this year. Yes. Another one, right? One of those one of those big games, the Subway Series, right? The, the Mets and the Yankees. I kind of talked about this one yesterday as well. That the Mets and the Yankees um, plan. You know, the Mets were a little bit disappointed this year. The Yankees were were off and on, but that's such a huge rivalry. Inner city, you know, New York Yankees. Excuse me, New York, New York Yankees, <laughs> New York Mets, and Francisco Lindor in the last game of the series hits three home runs, right? In a game, right? He hits one home run. I think to to they were they were down. He hits one. Hits another one to tie it. And then he hits the go-ahead home run to take the lead. It was just magical um, to see a player perform like that, basically put the team on his back. Um, I think he had four or five RBIs that game. Um, and, I mean, just like I said, the atmosphere of being in New York, them playing their cross-town rivalry, the Yankees, um, that was yeah. a huge, great game for baseball this year. And, and Francisco Lindor showed out, especially coming off the injury. Um, it was I was great to see him do that. And then we had a couple milestones this year, right? We saw Miggy, right, Miguel Cabrera, a player that we've watched growing yeah. up, right? He hit his 500th home run, which is, is crazy, right? So I was glad to see Miguel Cabrera be able to do that. I talked about Max Scherzer being my favorite pitcher this year, right? He got his 3,000th strikeout, right? And that's a, a mark we look at for all pitchers, right? The great ones, that 3,000 K. He was able to get that this year. And then, you know, pitching, I got a pitcher with me. I love pitching. We got to talk about, we saw a couple of immaculate innings this year, as, as, as well as all of the no-hitters. We saw a couple of immaculate innings from Max Scherzer and Chris Hill, two of the best pitchers in the game. So, um, just, you know, that's something we haven't seen in a while as well. So those were just some great moments. Some of my favorite moments from the baseball season. There's a bunch we missed. The Mariners um, being able to, to make that push towards the end and almost end their 20-year playoff drought. Um, they just needed a yeah. few more wins. Um, the St. Louis Cardinals going on 17 straight when they were pretty much out of the wild card race, winning 17 straight to pretty much, you know, make everybody else out of the wild card yeah. race. <laughs> um, winning like 18 or 20 to end the season at the right time. You know, they could have won those games in April and May and not made the playoffs. Instead, they won them in September and secured a wild card spot. So um, big shout out to them in, in St. Louis. Those were some of the, the best moments in baseball. And I know when we talked before, we talked a little bit about how baseball, especially with the influx of young players and how great they're playing, how that's done so much for the game. Right. We talked about like how we can increase interest in the game and, and how can baseball be more appealing to younger people. Right. And how can we get that viewership up? Because when you look at it, Right now, we have so many sports going on, and I would, wouldn't hesitate to say that baseball may be third to, to most people's oh, eyes, sure. right? And, and on most people's minds, if you think you got the NFL and, and the NBA, even though we're in the World Series, baseball is still third, right? But I think yeah. there's so many great young players in the game, and, and the swag that they bring, like Tatis, when he hits the home run, you know, he comes around, um, you know, doing the, the little hop step at third base, or Jazz Chisholm when he hits the home run, you know, doing, doing the Euro. Hit the step, Euro, you know? yeah. And they went, and then we saw the Euro step get, get mimicked when he struck out this yeah. year. You know, Carlos Correa saying, it's my time. Like, I, I just really think that's the way that baseball should trend. It makes it more exciting. We want to see the excitement. We want to see pitchers get hype after strikeouts, right? You know what I'm saying? No hitters throwing perfect games and things like that. And we want to see if you hit a home run or you hit a big RBI, you know, double, single, whatever. I want to see the passion. You know what I mean? I want to see, you know, Mookie Betts, you know, doing exactly. all that. Like, <laughs> yeah, and so – I think that that's great for baseball. I, t I think baseball took a step forward with that this year, and it's only going to add more excitement and more viewership to the game if we keep letting um, these young players just kind of, you know, ball and, and, and show out. Yeah, man, I think when you think about baseball, right, like the success rate is so low compared to other sports. Like when you get some success in baseball, you should be able to appreciate it. I mean, it only comes on a very good – for a very good player three out of 10 times in the box. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> we got to appreciate, you know, the success that we get. I, I'm all for it. Um, as a pitcher, as a former pitcher, like if, if you get one off of me, you know, you take me deep in a, in a really pivotal moment, I'm going to be happy. You know what I'm saying? That you, you can share, have all the energy that you want, you know, but next time up, if I get you, you know, just expect that same energy back. So, you know, yeah. I like the way the game is going. Um, too many times we're just told to like almost be like, kind of emotionless out there sometimes and yeah. like we're playing sports right you know we have that yeah. like aggressive type nature in us I think it's great yeah. for the game it makes the game more exciting to watch and uh can't wait to see more of it um coming up with the world series and uh and ongoing seasons as we get these younger players as they kind of like grow up in, in major league baseball so yeah and it, it's definitely been a gentleman's game and, and I think the fear is is that it won't be a gentleman's game right if they influx like if they include more of that but I still think it will, right? We've been playing baseball. 
they've been playing baseball their whole lives, right? Like that's what they've came up in. And it, and it's funny because, you know, we say like in football, you know, we see them like go crazy with the celebrations or the taunting and different things. Like basketball, we see the same thing. Carlos Correa, he said it's my time. And we were like, oh. All right. <laughs> we're not used to seeing that in baseball. So he literally pointed to his watch and said, it's my time. And I watched that like on Instagram like 20 times in a row. Like, I just, Absolutely. It was so electric to me. And it's like, that's because we're not used to seeing that. But I still think even with that, it'll continue to be a gentleman's game. Like you said, in a pivotal spot, nobody's going to hit a, a, a solo leadoff home run in the first inning and beat their chest, right? You know what I mean? Right. It, was, it yeah. is still going to be a gentleman's game. But when you, you hit those crucial moments, um, yeah, we want to see emotion in sports. And and to try to take that away from an athlete, um, it just isn't cool. So I, I think moving forward, that's just only going to make baseball more appealing. So we talked about kind of these young players um, just coming into the game and, 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 and taking it by storm, right? We saw so many young players have great seasons this year. Um, yeah. Old, you know, pitchers, hitters, relief pitchers, closers. Um, it's just a lot of good baseball this year. So who were, who was or were some of your favorite players to watch this season, Jakar? Yeah, I got a few. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, being in LA, uh, I think the, like, I don't want to say like uh resurgence but seeing max muncie put together a great season in in la this year i think was great for the dodgers um you think about kind of how much development they've had i mean for a year it was like the dodgers had a rookie of the year like <laughs> every year you know yeah. uh, every season um you know obviously picking up mookie bets was great uh, for them in free agency but then you know you get to like Max Muncy, right, leads the teams in home runs, I believe, and RBIs is like the ML, uh, the MVP of the team. And, you know, you think about that lineup. I mean, you got former MVPs in Betts and Bellinger, and Max Muncy leads the team, you know, all season. And, unfortunately, he got hurt down the stretch here. But I think that was really pivotal to me to watch him uh, this season. And then I'm going to stay in Southern California and go AL. Watching Shohei Otani all year was great. Besides the home run derby, he absolutely <laughs> did not <laughs> uh, live up to expectations there. Shout I want Soto um, again. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, uh, Shohei Otani, like, to see, like, a full 162-game season from him and see what he could do offensively but also on the mound was great. 40-plus home runs. He stole over 25 bags um, and won nine games on an Angels team that we all know, you know, has not, you know, like, uh, lived up to the expectations that they would say they have set for themselves. So both AL and NL right there, staying in Southern California, there was a lot of good baseball to watch in, 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 in the Southern California area. So, yeah. And let me put this in perspective for our viewers that don't watch a lot of baseball. You're going to hear that and be like, oh, he won nine games. That's that's it, right? So you, right, have, to understand, yeah. you have to understand that to get a win in baseball as a pitcher, you have to pitch at least five innings, leave the game with the lead, and then that lead has to hold for the remainder of the game. So Absolutely, getting nine yeah. wins as a pitcher is not easy at all. And that speaks to what you talked about earlier with Julio Urias getting 20 of those, right? 20 right. times he left the game after the fifth inning with the lead and that lead maintained, right? That's great pitching. Um, Shohei Otani definitely has to be on my list this year. I spent my birthday, September 16th, in Chicago at a White Sox game just to watch Shohei Otani. Although he didn't pitch, he batted, you know, he took five at bats and it was just breathtaking um, to see him in person. Uh, the, the fandemonium that comes with Shohei Otani, it was so many people there just to see Shohei. Um, it was crazy. Definitely one of the, my favorite players to watch this season. You talked about Fernando Tatis. Every time he came up at bat, you know, I was just glued to the screen. You never know. I mean, obviously he was hitting for power, leading the NL in home runs with 42 but he's just so electric, period. You know, if he hits yeah. what most people would, would be a single, he might stretch it to a double, right? Or if he hits what most people would, would, would stop at second, he might stretch it to, to third, right? You know what I mean? The stolen bases and stuff. And then just some of the, the plays he made at shortstop. I know a lot of people get on him because he makes a lot of errors, but that's because, you know, he gets to a lot of balls that most people won't get to, right? Absolutely. And so he's just an electric defensive player, an electric offensive player, um, just an electric young player, period. And then along with Manny Machado, one of my favorite players, um, as well, that Slam Diego team was just really fun, even though they didn't, you know, meet the expectations that we have for them. I think another team was the Blue Jays, right? Um, just that whole team, just just young and, um, you know, full. I mean, they hit I think the most home runs in the league, or they were very close. But you talk about Vlad Guerrero, uh, Marcus Simeon, Bo Bichette, Lourdes Gurriel, uh, Robbie Ray. I mean, that was just a really fun team to watch. I was hoping that they could find a way to get into the playoffs, but I think the Red Sox just started off too well. Um, 
The Yankees, you know, they had that stretch of winning 13 straight. They had stretches where they won a lot of games. And the Blue Jays really didn't pick up until George Springer came off an injury. But I think they were one of the best teams in baseball after he came off of injury. And then two of my other favorite players in the game, some of my some other uh, young hitters that both have World Series championships before the age of 25. We talked about Juan Soto earlier and just his plate discipline and his vision at the plate is second yeah. to none. I think, you know, in the shortened, you know, Mickey Mouse season, <laughs> he did lead the league in batting <laughs> average, hitting like 356, which is insane. I don't care if it's over 60 games or not. 356 is insane. Um, I think he had like, it was like almost 15 times this year where he went down 0-2 in the count and still ended up with a walk, which is insane. You know what I mean? Like he is just one of the most polished um, and, and best hitters. I mean, people have started the, the Barry Bonds comparisons. Obviously, you'll probably never hit home runs the way Barry Bonds did, but people have started right. the comparisons just that he's going to get on base almost. I mean, it seems like almost 50% of the time, which is insane. And then another player who's already won a championship before the age of 25, my boy in Boston, Rafi Devers. I just love watching Rafael Devers this year. Um, and he had a good season, I think over 100 RBIs, 30 uh, home runs. So uh, those were some of my favorite players to watch this year. And then a lot of great pitchers. I talked about uh, Max Scherzer, just the Dodgers, their pitching staff um, was was great this year, period. But pitching across the league, uh, what the Brewers did with their three aces, um, you know, it, it's just a lot of good pitching this year for sure. So those are some of my favorite players to watch. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good baseball this year for sure. Definitely. All right. So we're talking about some of our favorite players to watch, and we're going to be talking about the playoffs a little later. So, you know, the playoffs typically are going to be teams that had successful seasons. But, of course, there are going to be some teams that had disappointing seasons as well. Jakari, who was the most disappointing team to you this year in Major League Baseball? Yeah, yeah. I took a little different approach to this one, and I'll give a couple of reasons why. But I'm going to have to go with the Yankees. Um, we talk mm. about a franchise that uh, has a history of winning and expectation of winning. And for them to, you know, not make it out of a wild card game and, you know, make a playoff push this year after signing Garrett Cole, um, who is, you know, arguably the best pitcher in baseball. I mean, a flat out ace um, after the midseason acquisitions with Gallo and Anthony Rizzo um, to not be able to, like, get the job done. It's and for them to lose the way they did, you know, yeah. in Boston, yeah, yeah. right? You know, I, ah, oh, man, uh, I, I, it's a, it's a tough one for me not to pick the Yankees here because if anybody who is a Yankee fan or lives in New York knows that like the expectation is for them to win. Um, and, you know, I spoke on a little yesterday, but it's been like a decade since a New York uh, based like professional sports team has won a, a, a championship. Um, and I can guarantee you that everybody in the Yankees front office is, is talking about how they can like get back you know, until winning an AL pennant and making a, a World Series run. So I got to go with the Yankees here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, when you talk about the Yankees, that's that's a, a championship or bust team every year, right? Their expectation going in every year is championship or bust. And I like what you did there because we're talking about disappointing teams, but you're talking about a team that made the playoffs ultimately, but we know um, that that's not their goal. And, and two biggest takeaways from that is, like I I said, mentioned earlier to you that I think if that game is played in Yankee Stadium, you know, the Yankees move on, right? Because we saw yeah. John Carlos Stanton hit basically two 400 foot singles, right? right. He has two blast, two bombs, but they hit the green monster and come back into play. He thinks they're gone, so he doesn't hustle to second base. He ends up at first base both times. And then he hits like a weak little oppo home run, you know, <laughs> like 300 <laughs> feet, right? But he's blasting them off the green monster and they don't get any runs off of those, right? And yeah. so, you know, Boston ultimately wins that game. It just talks about home field advantage in baseball and the different dimensions of ballparks, um, which is, is cool. You know, every basketball court is 94 feet, right? Every every football, right, foot, right. Every football field is 100 yards. But a, a home run in Minute Maid may not be a home run in Truist Park in Atlanta, which we'll talk about um, our, our, our World Series matchup in a little bit. Yeah. I think the most disappointing team for me is easy to kind of pick on the Padres, right? They were everybody's kind of darling after making the playoffs last year. People were expecting – um, uh, you know, a great season from you, Darvis, this year. They picked up Blake Snell in the offseason as well as some position players. Um, and they weren't even, didn't even make the playoffs, actually ended up under 500. Uh, but I'm going to go with the, uh, another team. You know, Jakari gave us the surprise pick with the Yankees. So I'm going to go with the team um, that could have easily won their division this year, should have easily won their division this year. And instead, the winner of their division this year is in the World Series. I'm going to go with the Philadelphia Phillies, right? This is a team when they signed Bryce Harper a couple years ago. In 2019, that max of contract, we kind of thought that they would be on, you know, up next, right, in the NL East. And somehow the Braves, who lost their best player to a torn ACL yeah. in July, a team that was under 500 at the beginning of August, not only won the division, 
made the playoffs and is in the World Series. And I think the Phillies have to look at that as a huge disappointment. I know that there's to start off the year, um, their relief pitchers just weren't great, but they still had two aces in Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola. And then you have Bryce Harper, one of the best players in the game, and some other great position players as well. Um, I think out of – I can't remember how many uh, home runs Bryce Harper hit. It was about 36, but I think like almost 60 to 70 percent of his home runs were solo home runs, right? So not a lot of the players were getting on base, and he wasn't getting a lot of help. But still, the Braves only uh, won 88 games. I think the Phillies, you know, if this was the year, they should have found a way um, to, to try to, to win that division and make some noise in the playoffs because I think the Braves, they're only going to continue to get better. And they went out and were aggressive. Give them credit. They made a lot of uh, – moves at the the trade deadline they said you know we're not going to lose this season we were one game away from the world series last year we're not just going to chalk up this season because Acuna got hurt and and those moves ultimately put them uh, in the world series but I, I think the the Phillies have to be kicking themselves knowing that they missed out on the opportunity the Mets knocked on the door a little bit but I don't think they were ever close and they had a lot of injuries um, Jacob DeGrom Francisco Lindor um, Noah Syndergaard but the, the Phillies, you know, even picking up Kyle Gibson from my Rangers at the deadline, I, I, I just thought that they should have made a better push uh, to, to win that division this year and be sitting at home again. Now two straight seasons, not making a playoff since giving Bryce Harper $300 million. Um, You know, you kind of have to, 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 to look yourself in the mirror, right, and, and wonder yeah. what they're doing in Philadelphia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you, you spoke on it a lot through that about just like the trade deadline and a lot of key acquisitions made on teams that, you know, uh, had expectations of making playoff runs and some worked out, some didn't, you know, and sometimes yeah. like we talk about, it's not, you know, how much money you spend that like produces a, yeah. a, a, a world series ring. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. So payroll doesn't win championships. We thought we were going to sure see the don't. Dodgers and the Yankees on paper. Right. But yeah. you brought up an interesting point. This trade deadline was crazy. I think we've seen the mo most moves um, that we've seen really in a long time. Was there any move that just stuck out to you this year at the trade deadline or one that you really felt helped propel a team? After, after yeah. the trade deadline? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think for me, looking at the, the trade deadline in whole, I, you know, obviously, you know, what the Braves did worked out. But I think for the Dodgers to go out and get an ace like Max Scherzer, like on a pitching staff with if that pitching staff is healthy, Dustin May back, Clayton Kershaw there as well, like that pitching staff is lights out already. Um, for them to make those key acquisitions with everything that happened in LA and get a batting champ in Trey Turner, um, major pickups. Um, and I think it just uh, salutes uh, the Dodgers front office to winning right now. They understand that like they have the core set, they can add pieces around it um, and, and, and to be successful right now. So I think they made a great uh, acquisition. Obviously it didn't work out down the stretch, but when you think about, you know, obviously what the Dodgers did pitching wise, I mean, their ERA uh, in the postseason was by far uh, superior versus any other teams was speaks to like the Max Scherzer pickup on top of already good pitching staff. So I, I'd have to go Dodgers. I know, I know I feel like I'm, I'm kind of getting biased here, but I mean, look at how <laughs> yeah. good that team is offensively. Um, mm -hmm. and if that team is healthy, just offensively, right. You put Mac Muncy back in the lineup, like with that pitching staff, it's, it's hard not to see how, how things don't go well in LA with that type of uh, lineup and makeup. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if, Probably there would be a consensus answer if we were talking about the most impactful, right? It would have to be a Braves. They don't make the yeah. World Series without making all of those uh, offseason uh, additions. Um, but I would definitely say I would go with the Dodgers as well, but I would go Trey Turner. Obviously, you talked about Max Scherzer. I think he won his first eight or nine starts um, as a Dodger, yeah. right? Um, got his 3,000K as a Dodger through Immaculate Inning as a Dodger. But I also talk about Trey Turner, right? Getting him. And what if they gave up K-Bear Ruiz and I think Josiah Gray? I mean, you know, K-Bear Ruiz is a great, you know, catching prospect. And we'll see what Josiah Gray turns into in, in pitching, but they have the pitch, right? And you have Dustin yeah. May, who's, what, 22, 23 years old. I mean, he's, he's really young, and he looks great as well. Um, but getting Trey Turner, right, it's, it's, it's almost a foregone conclusion at this point that the Dodgers are probably going to lose Corey Seager, right? And so you, you get Trey Turner, who can come in and play with Corey Seager, although he didn't have the best, you know, last half of the season at second base. It was an adjustment. But now you can just slide him over to shortstop if you indeed do lose uh, Corey Seager. You have Trey Turner under contract for another year so. I'll just kind of piggyback on your Max Scherzer, uh, you yeah. know, acquisition and then raise you uh, Trey Turner. But I think the Dodgers did a great job um, at the trade deadline. And not only, right, did the Dodgers get Max Scherzer, they kept him away from the Padres, which was huge because the Padres yeah. continued to struggle with their starting pitching. And I think Max Scherzer would have changed life for the Padres and the Dodgers didn't allow that to happen. So 
that was a huge pickup. All right. So last but not least, before we get into the playoffs and the World Series, really quick, AL MVP, NL MVP, who is it and why? Yeah, yo, we'll start off with the AL. I'm like, I think everybody in the AL knows who the MVP is. If they don't, then um, I don't know what they were watching all year. But Shohei Otani, by far, uh, AL MVP, 40-plus home runs. I think around 100 RBIs. I don't know if he got over 100 or not. Stole, I think, 26 bases this year. Oh, and then he, you know, throws 100 miles an hour. Has a really good splitter in one nine games with the ERA, like, a little over three. Um, So, I, I, it's hard to put that into perspective to other sports, but, you know, um, you know, I just, just imagine like in football, like, you know, your starting quarterback, like, you know, playing safety, you know, <laughs> like, it, and like having picks. Being sixes. good at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it's, it's really hard to like, I think fathom like how uh, awesome of a year Shohei Otani had. So obviously my AL MVP pick um, and congrats to him and salute to him for, just a great year. And on MVP, um, this one's a little bit tricky, uh, but I think ultimately I have to go with Juan Soto. Um, the guy uh, just, he's hes a just a productive player um, all around the board. You look at just how he hits um, and you, you talked a little bit about it earlier about his eye and he has such a good feel while he's in the batter's box for the strike zone. Um, look at the other two people who were kind of in the race for MVP, Tatis, uh, Harper. And you start to look at the stats and see like Juan Soto's walk to strikeout ratio is over one. I think it's close to 1.4 or 1.5. He walked 145 times, whereas Tatis and Harper, it was under one. So they struck out more than they walked. And I think ultimately like Juan Soto can give you the long ball just like Tatis and Harper can, but he also gives you a guy that is a very tough out otherwise. Um, and so Juan Soto is my NL MVP. He's going to be great uh, for years to come. And I think this is, you know, one of, of, of many um, uh, for, for him. So uh, watch out for Juan Soto in the future for sure. Yeah. So I definitely think um, as far as AL MVP, I was kind of earlier in the season. Maybe I just wanted to be different. You know, I was rooting for Vladdy, especially when he was going towards that triple crown. Um, but like you said, I, I I couldn't overthink it. I spent my birthday watching this man, Shohei Otani. Um, we talked about what he did, being able to hit 42 home runs. People talked about his batting average dipping at the end of the season. I mean, he had nothing to play for. He's playing for an Angels team that had no chance of making the playoffs. No. He literally just went up there wailing at pitches, trying to, to stay in that home run race, right, with, with Vladdy and, and Salvi Perez. Um, and I would say shout out to Salvi as well. What he did this season as a catcher, I saw one of his home runs in Minute May, so I feel like I was a part of his historic season. But shout out Salvi. But like I said, we can't overthink it. Uh, AL MVP is is Shohei Otani. You hit 42 home runs and strike out 150 batters. I mean, nobody else can say that. Literally, well, Babe Ruth can't even say it, right? And that's the only comparison yeah. we can. So that's just insane, right? I love the Juan Soto pick. I want to go with Juan Soto, but I know it's and this was a weird season, right? Where none of our MVP candidates were really tied to winning, right? Like none of our strongest yeah. MVP candidates were in the playoffs. Um, but I think I have to go with Fernando Tatis, right? I, I think that Fernando Tatis is going to win it. I talked about just how exciting he is. He was on the IL three different times and still led the NL um, at home runs. I think that's insane. Um, and like I said, we just don't have a definitive, you know, some people mentioned Austin Riley with the way that the Braves played at the last half of the season. Um, and there were people mentioned Brandon Crawford just because they led, uh, the uh, major league and in, in wins this year. But I think ultimately Fernando Tatis is the MVP. Like I said, three stints on the uh, IL leading the, the national league in home runs. I mean, he could have, I mean, he probably would have touched 50, right? If he, if he, yeah. if he didn't go three stints on, on, on the, he probably could have led major leagues um, in home runs. He would have had over 30 stolen bases if he didn't go to the IL three times. So as, as disappointing as the Padres were, Fernando Tatis, Fernando Tatis had a hell of a season. Um, and he's one of the faces of baseball. You know, he's on he's on the uh, the, the cover of MLB the show. And you, so, you know, they would love to give him an MVP. And, and I think he's going to win it. But you made a very compelling case for, for Juan Soto. And he's going to get a few of them before he retires, for sure. Yeah, for so sure. So that's our regular season recap. But then we had the playoffs. So just really quickly, I'm going to run through the playoffs. On the NL wildcard side, we had the Dodgers and the Red Hot. St. Louis Cardinals, the Dodgers were able to knock them off with the Chris Taylor CT3 walk-off home run. On the AL side, we had one of the best rivalries in baseball, just American sports, period. The Yankees and the Red Sox, we saw John Carlo hitting baseballs everywhere, but it didn't matter. 
the Red Sox moved on, right? In the ALDS, we had the Rays who made it to the World Series last year, losing to the Dodgers, get upset in the first round by the Red Sox. We also saw the Astros and the White Sox. The Astros handled the White Sox very handily. On the NL side, we had the NLDS. We had the Braves and the Brewers, right? And the Braves took care of them. The Brewers couldn't hit a volleyball for some reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we had the, the Goliath matchup of the Dodgers and the Giants, the two most winning teams in the um, MLB this season. And the Dodgers were able to prevail against their in-state rivals. We move on to the championship series on the AL side. People called it not the champion series, the cheater series. We know what happened with the Astros and the Red Sox. Where's the right? trash can? <laughs> yeah. The Red Sox were in control of that series. And then, you know, there was a crucial ball or strike call. Astros took advantage. They dominated the rest of the series to go to their third World Series in the last five years. On the NL side, right, we saw a repeat of last year's um, NLCS between the Dodgers and the Braves. The Braves went up 3-1 last year. They lost that lead. They went up 3-1 this year. And they went to the World Series in six games. So now that creates the matchup between the Braves and the Astros. So, Jakari, just kind of give me – well, first, before we, we, we go to the World Series, just give me kind of your recap. What are your biggest takeaways from, from, from playoff baseball to playoff baseball we've seen up until this point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we saw so much, uh, I think, offense – throughout the playoffs that it's uh it's it's crazy to even like fathom you know, the a lot of different statistics you know uh, offensively uh we saw a lot of breakout from different players Kike Hernandez was red hot uh to start the playoffs I mean the guy was on fire and then he just kind of just sizzled out towards the end right uh yeah. but uh I mean he had a great uh postseason for the Boston Red Sox so uh, a acquisition of theirs that they got from the Dodgers that really panned out for them um you, you talk about kind of what the uh Astros have done from guys like Tucker and uh Jordan Alvarez where they really stepped up like I think Tucker is like top three he may be leading in postseason RBIs yeah right? he has four and I, yeah yeah, you know, um, stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, really stands out to me. And Alvarez, I think, you know, they, they saw a crazy stat, like what he did uh, the last three games in the series versus the Red Sox. I think he by himself out hit the Red Sox. Last yeah, yeah. I think he outscored him in the last two games for sure. Yeah. And he probably outscored out him. Before. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me, right? You know, you talk about guys, like, taking over, yeah. and, and you think we're not even talking yeah. for the Astros about Bregman, Altuve, or Correa. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, obviously we, we had like uh, great moments from guys like Chris Taylor, again, who you mentioned had the big home running game in the, in the game versus the Cardinals, but then came up with a three home run game, reminiscent of Reggie Jackson in New York, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and also just kind of the analytics home field advantage. We talked a little bit about in the Dodgers Brave series, how uh, Trey Turner had a really uh, pivotal a uh, fly ball, fly out to left field where, you know, you look at the analytics on it and in every other ballpark, it's a home run, but in Atlanta, it's not right. Big game yeah. changer there. Um, we saw uh, good pitching from the Dodgers as well. Dave Roberts really moved around the, the bullpen and incorporated starting pitchers all throughout the, the series. And we saw a lot of bullpen games, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which something, we, you know, games. haven't used to, you know, aren't used to seeing too much, but, uh, you know, we just we had a lot of just variation of things going on in the playoffs this year and uh, which leads us to where we are now with the Braves and Astros. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you talked about that. I, I think just the kind of the intensity of the moment was, was the, the biggest thing for me um, on the AL side. We saw kind of the, the explosion of offense, right, where we were constantly seeing like nine, six games and. I mean, they were just going up there hitting, you know, we saw three grand slams in the Astros Red Sox series. I mean, that was just a lot of hitting. But then on the NL side, right, we, we saw kind of the, the crucial decision making. It was a lot more pitching, a lot more bullpen games, a lot more crucial pitching decision, especially when you have the pitcher batting, right? You have to know when to take your pitcher out, right? When to, to bring in a pitch hitter in. Do you leave in the pitcher because he's dealing or do you sacrifice the pitcher for some offense, right? Do you sacrifice some offense for some great pitching? And we saw a lot of those decisions kind of come to form, um, on the NL side, and I think that's a big reason why the Braves made it to the World Series because their manager has, has pretty much managed flawlessly um, this postseason. I think that's a big reason um, why they're in the World Series to this point. And then I think we saw um, some of the biggest moments when, you know, we talked kind of all, and I think that's the beauty of baseball, right? We have a team um, in the World Series that lost 
probably their best player earlier in the year to a season ending injury, right? We, we talked about, you know, Bryce Harper getting a $300 million contract. We talked about all these MVP candidates. And, and, and the biggest players in the ALCS and the NLCS was Eddie Rosario and, and Jordan Alvarez. Now, of course, you know, yeah. Jordan looks like a, 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 I mean, just a future superstar, you know, if he isn't already. We were talking about, but he broke the record for uh, the best batting average in a championship series. And then Eddie Rosario breaks it the next night, right? Like we saw 522 and 567 respectively. It's insane, right? So we're just talking about baseball, right? It's such a next man up sport. It's such a anybody on the roster can be the biggest hero of the game, right? When you talk about football, right? It's going to be Tom Brady. Tom Brady's going to be the story. They're going to live and die by Tom Brady. When you talk about basketball, the Lakers are going to live and die by LeBron, right? But in baseball, on any moment, you know, you could you could send your ace, your your best pitcher out there, and the relief pitcher could, could be the story of the game, right? We're, like I said, yeah. we're talking about Eddie Rosario, 14 hits, um, and the NLCS is just crazy, right? So anybody can be the hero in any moment. The pinch hitter can come off the bench and be the hero. The pinch runner can come in and steal a base, you know? So um, it's just an every man sport, right? And, and and I think those were the, the, the biggest moments to me. And just like I said, the intensity, right? Every at-bat is amplified. Every pitch is amplified. Every decision is amplified. And, and we saw, you know, every base running decision is amplified. We saw a lot of people get thrown out, right, trying to stretch, you know, maybe a double to a, a triple, trying to stretch a single to a double, trying to steal a base in a crucial moment, right? We saw the strike them out, throw them out, which was huge um, in the Astros series against Verdugo, against the Red Sox. So, I mean, you know, in the regular season, that might affect you too much. But in, in the postseason, those, those, those players right there lose series. All right. Yeah. The moment we've been waiting for. The moment they've all been waiting for, without telling me who's going to win the World Series, Shikari, just give me an early analysis on it. Yeah, absolutely. And when I think about like the postseason so far and what both these teams have done, uh, I think this year, uh, whoever wins the World Series is going to be the, the team who uh, hits the long ball and whose bullpen pitching really steps up. Uh, we've seen just so many bullpen games, you know, uh, this postseason uh, guys go up to bat and it's like, you're facing, you know, a different pitcher every at bat. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the analytics and just kind of history on a lot of these pitchers and, and hitters going late into games is really going to come into play. Um, I think about both teams, bullpens, um, mentor and uh, Matt Zek for Atlanta have been really good. Um, and Presley's been really good for Houston. Um, I think whoever can get their ball to their closer first is going to win games. I mean, these guys have been lights out in the playoffs, um, and I think that it's going to continue that way. Um, and, and, and down the stretch, it, we're really going to see, like, the, you know, emergence of some of these guys and how they perform when the lights are on, when the stage is set for them. Uh, you know, we talk about a little bit about the – home field advantage now with playing at the different fields, right? You know, Atlanta, how do they handle, you know, playing in Houston, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and with not, uh, with the designated hitter, et cetera, um, and vice versa, what does Houston do when they go to Atlanta, you know, for those, uh, if we, they get all three games in Atlanta. So um, ultimately, long ball and home runs is, is, is it for me, it's kind of what it's been this postseason, but for the Astros, it's little been a little bit more of like clutch to out hitting. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, we look at these teams and the makeup of them, the uh, Braves have a lot of guys in the lineup that can hit the long ball as do the Astros um, and whoever comes out, you know, swinging is going to be the difference maker for sure. Yeah, so those are a, a lot of great points. I think some of the, the biggest keys to the series for me, well, first of all, let me talk a little bit about both teams. You're looking at maybe two of the, the best defensive teams in baseball, if not the two best, especially in the infield. Um, you talk about like Carlos Correa and Altuve, the plays that their ability, you know, they're able to make. And then similarly, uh, on the Braves side with, with Swansby and, and, and Albies um, in the infield, these are great uh, defensive teams. Like you said, they're teams that both are very capable of, of hitting the home run. Right. Um, they have a lot of the home run hitters, um, not only and I mean, more specifically the Braves. Right. The, the Astros just kind of have the crazy kind of all star you know, in the lineup. Everybody can hit a home run damn near. And then, you know, the, the Braves have that, too, as well. And, and a lot of home run hit, uh, power on the bench as well. Um, I think the Braves pitching has been a little bit better than the Astros thus far in the playoffs. But I also think the Astros have faced maybe tougher lineups. Right. And then, you, you know, you're facing one more hitter. Um, as far as the DH than the pitching. So I think three things that are going to be really key in this series. Um, one, uh, 
is how Dusty manages in Atlanta, right? So the Astros are going to, because of the AL rules, they're used to having the DH, and their DH is typically Jordan Alvarez, right? And he's a great hitter, but he's a below average fielder. He usually plays left field. So when the Astros go to Atlanta, you have to put Jordan Alvarez in left field. So you sacrifice a little defensively. Of course, you have to keep him in the lineup for the hitting, but you sacrifice a little defensively with him in left field. And you also have to take Michael Brantley out of the lineup, who I believe was third in the AL um, and batting average this year. So I think that's going to be a huge thing, right? Like just how that plays and then how Dusty manages in Atlanta, right? Because like you said, you know, you're going to have to know, you know, your pitchers are hitting. I have to know when to take your pitchers out, maybe pinch hit, right? Like I said, like, what do you do with, you know, Jordan and, and Michael Brantley? How often do you bring Brantley in the pitch hit? Um, because, you know, like I said, with him being third in the AL, if you're not hitting or, you know, the home runs aren't flying or, you know, you're a little cold, you need those calming presences like him and, and uh, Yuli Gurriel to come in and, you know, those players that just find a way to, to get a hit or get on base. Um, I think another thing is you talked about the dimensions of the ballpark, right? The Astros and the Minute Maid, the short coffee boxes, right? Kind of the short ports to left field. I think that's going to be huge, right? Like how who takes the most advantage of that? We've seen the Astros do that for years. Altuve, Correa, Bregman just blasting balls right there to the Crawford Absolutely. boxes. But can the, can the Astros come in – excuse me. Can the Braves come into Houston and take advantage of that, especially with four games being in Houston um, and, and three games being in Atlanta? And then another thing, too, that I wanted to bring up, right, is the, the Astros and the Braves have hit pretty much the same amount of home runs this postseason. The Astros have hit 13 home runs. The Braves have hit 12. But the Astros have scored way more runs than the Braves, which shows me that the Braves are more dependent on their home runs to score runs. So I think in this series, it's going to be – you mentioned the home run, who hits the home run, but also who's able to manufacture runs from singles, doubles, extra base hits, and, and aggressive base running. I think that's going to be the biggest thing as well. Because if we see great pitching, there may not be a lot of home runs. And the Braves, just like the Astros have been able to, are going to have, be able to, you know, pass the baton, you know, and get a base runner here, a base runner here, and score runs that way instead of strictly relying on the home run. So those are going to be my biggest takeaways from this series, and I think that's going to help determine who wins this series. Before, you, before I tell you, before we tell you who we think is going to win the series, I have a very special guest from y'all, for y'all, excuse me, University of Houston alum, huge Astros fan. We got Chrissy underscore G with us, and she is here to tell us why the Astros are going to win the World Series. I'm not even going to play with her and ask her who's going to win, why the Astros are <laughs> going to win the World Series, and how many games they're going to win it in. So, Chrissy, I'm so glad to have you. Glad to have you here talking baseball. You got the floor. Tell us why the Astros are going to win the World Series. Uh, grateful to be here. Uh, first reason why the Astros are going to be um, – I'm sorry, Astros are going to win um, is because I just landed – in Houston from Atlanta, and the hate was so real, you know, hate was so real, <laughs> have, my, have my Astros gear on, and I mean, they're just obviously intimidated, I mean, it's nothing but fear, everywhere I went, you know, they were just like, cheaters, get it out of here, okay, well, we'll see what happens next, okay, <laughs> um, but also, you know, Houston, we're just such a clutch city, like you said earlier, uh, it is an everyman sport, um, the three people that you mentioned earlier, it really takes uh, Brantley, Jordan, and Ayuli, those silent assassins, just to come through and just, you know, shock the whole audience, you know. Um, they're not always – well, Jordan is definitely a different player than he was last year, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. But um, it really takes uh, every man just to come in and play their role. But it usually uh, – what was it, game four, game five, Jordan just really came in and just – you know, really just was, you know, hitting it for us. You know, he was yeah, really definitely. the hero. Yeah, he was really the hero out there. Um, so, yeah, we need him to stay on the field, stay healthy, you know, to just do the job. Uh, you know, we also have a decent amount of pitchers, you know. Uh, Verlander, he doesn't really disappoint me. Uh, Grand King, you know, just depends on the mood that he's in that day. But, you know, we really have a solid team. Uh, I've always said that Houston and Atlanta were very similar. Like, if any city is like Houston – I feel like Atlanta's most similar, you know, as far as like the vibe, the culture, and even with sports, especially with baseball. Um, I don't think either cities get enough uh, clout as other cities do when we're doing good, you know, we're cheaters, the same thing with Atlanta. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm hoping to see something new. I definitely did not want to see the Dodgers and the Astros again. Uh, we already seen it. I feel like we can call the whole game, you know, especially with the lineup. But I'm really excited to see uh, Jordan and Rosario go back to back. 
Um, and Correa, you know, we don't know how long we're going to have him for, you know, so I'm praying that, you know, we pay the man, we do what we need to do because we wouldn't be here really, um, you know, just for the the few hits that he did do, we wouldn't be here without Correa. So uh, either way, Correa is one of those people who's just going to do the job regardless of what the situation is, regardless of how Dusty's managing the lineup, um, because we never know what type of day Dusty's going to have that day. Um, right. Uh, and then Altuve, you know, uh, and this is a stretch, so don't crucify me. Uh, Soda reminds me of Altuve when Altuve first got started. The only difference is Soda actually knows how to look for a ball. Altuve will swing at anything. Um, but when he's swinging at the perfect pitch, it's out the park. So just hope that we don't have a grand slam that day. So that's just my take. Um, so I'm happy to uh, – hopefully I'm at one of these games. You know, I'm, I'm hoping to get my tickets. But um, I, I know we're going to win. I'll probably say four. Oh, okay. Astros in four. Astros uh, in four. Astros, said, you, you said said it again. No, no, no. I'm set, so I'm definitely for going for the Astros, but I'm, I'm okay, hoping to yeah, okay. yeah, I'm hoping to be at uh our game four. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Got gotcha, you, my bad. So Astros in four, five, six, or seven. What you got, Chrissy? Real oh, quick. Um, I really want to. I really want to see a full series. You know, like this. This is this is exciting to me. I'm not trying to say that we're going to completely just, you know, Tomb Raider in there. I would actually like to see all seven games, to be honest with you. Um, but that's just me just being on my toes. Like I said, I, I wanted to see a new series. I wanted to see what um, Morton and Smiley could do, you know, just a few uh, people or just the team I'm not that familiar with. So, yeah. um, and just, just with Atlanta coming, like you were talking about the advantage. I don't know if you guys remember, like years ago, Minnie Mae used to have that heel and other teams would struggle to go up that uh, back outfield here, you know. So it's yep. just always exciting when we have teams that come in so they could just talk about whatever complaints they have in our stadium. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just excited, so I want to see all seven games, honestly. So, hey, if we got to do it at game seven, then we're going to sweep on game seven. Not y'all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Astros, Astros in seven. I love that pick. Jakari, who wins the World Series, how many games, and why? Yeah, I'm going uh, – I'm copying Chrissy here. I'm going Astros in seven, and I'll tell you why. If you look at the bullpen pitching for the Braves, um, I think some of their best bullpen pitching, uh, certainly with Tyler Matzik, is left-handed. And I think ultimately they'll have a response for Tucker and Jordan Alvarez. But how are they going to manage that left-handed pitching versus Altuve – versus Correa, versus Bregman, the righties in this lineup who we know can hit left-handed pitching. And I think the fact that they've been here, like you said, third time in five years, they got the experience. Um, I don't know how many players on the Braves have actually been to a World Series. Um, so I think this is uncharted waters for them. And I think those two reasons are why I'm picking Astros in seven. I, I think they're going to, Braves are going to show up. Um, obviously they got, you know, Freddie Freeman and, and we're the way Rosario's playing right now. Um, you know, they're going to, I think they're going to take a few games, but ultimately I don't think they have enough to be H down, not four yeah. games at home. Yeah. All right, man. So I got to make my pick, right? So seven game series. I think the first two games in Houston are going to be split. I actually think that the Braves are going to win game one. Um, you know, I just think they're coming off of a little bit more, more momentum. Um, so they're going to win game one. And I think the Astros bounce back and win game two as the series shifts to Atlanta. So I think the series is going to shift to Atlanta in the game three with the series being tied 1-1, right? So then with the 2-3-2 two, two format, we have three games in Atlanta. I think Atlanta wins two of those games, right? Bear with me. I think Atlanta wins two of those games to come back to Houston in game six up 3-2. The Astros are going to be down 3-2 when they come back to Houston. When the Astros come back to Houston down 3-2, they're going to win game six and game seven to get their second championship in the last five years. Y'all know who I had to go with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Y'all know I wasn't going to pick anybody else. Ultimately, I just think that they have too much hitting. I think that the Braves uh, ERA, the Braves pitching ERA has been a point better than uh, like a full point better than the Astros starting pitching. But like I said, that's going to happen when you give up three grand slams in a series and just the hitting and, and the scoring runs in the AL was crazy. I think the, the, the Braves had the benefit of, like I said, playing the Brewers who had two hits the whole season. I mean, excuse me, two hits the whole series with runners in scoring position. Um, when you look at it, the, the Astros and the Braves have both played 10 games to get to the World Series. The Astros have scored 67 runs. The Braves have only scored 40. 
And I talked about that. The Astros have hit 13 home runs. The Braves have only hit 12, right? And so I think the biggest thing is, is that the Astros know how to pass the baton, right? They know how to, okay, you go up there, take a walk, get a hit. You go up there, take a walk, and get a hit. As many of them can hit home runs, they also know how to hit singles and doubles. They know how to manipulate ballparks better than almost any roster um, in the MLB. And ultimately, I just think that when you go strength on strength, right, the, the, the Astros hitting versus the Braves pitching, the Astros is going to win out, and that's why they're going to win in seven. I think some huge keys, like I said, is just how Dusty manages in Atlanta. We know Dusty traditionally likes to leave his pitchers in, may leave them in a little too long. And, and the Braves manager has been flawless in some of the decisions he's made. Probably one of the biggest reasons they're in the World Series. So Dusty can't get outmanaged. Um, but I think even if he does get outmanaged, the talent on Houston's side um, is just really too much to ignore and, and too much to overcome. Especially, um, you know, their pitching started off shaky, but Framber Valdez and Luis Garcia, they have some great uh, performances in, in the ALCS. And so I think, you know, ultimately they're, they're going to win the World Series this year. So Astros, you know, they beat all the allegations, you know, they proved that, you know, maybe they didn't need the trash cans and you know, anything like that. But, no, I think the, the, the Astros come back and, and, and they win it in game seven this year. Another thing, too, is we talked about the base running. Right. And I think a huge thing that's not being talked about with the two catchers. Right. And so Maldonado and, and Darno. Right. So Maldonado hasn't been great this postseason. I think he only has like two hits um, and Darno hasn't just batted a lot, uh, period, I don't think. Um, but they um, defensively, I think the Astros have a huge advantage. Right. Because if the Braves try to be aggressive and steal bases or be aggressive on the base paths, we know that Maldonado, the machete, that's what they call him here in Houston. You can't run on him. It's almost impossible to run on him. But conversely, we saw what the Dodgers did to Dart. No, they were running that wheel, right? And I think that's going to be a huge difference maker in this series, too. The, the fact that the Astros are going to be able to take bases when they want, it seems statistically against Darno And the Braves, that's not going to be a big part of their game because you just simply can't run on Maldonado. I think that's going to be a huge part of the series as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yep. So thank you all. Like I said, I had Jakari Bass with me, you know, my pitching expert, my brother, line brother. Um, today with me and then of course my special guest our resident Astros fan we all said Astros in seven Chrissy G thank you for being with me once again thank y'all for tuning in to Spot on Sports tune it in to our first baseball special we promise we're going to give y'all more baseball content moving forward trying to make it one of the bread and butter sports it already went, is one of the bread and butter sports but you don't see it talked about a lot in the media especially on the debate shows and we just want to give y'all more content and definitely spread the game so thank y'all for tuning in to the Spot on Sports baseball special Spot on sports, where we're not just accurate, we spot on. Thank you.